Welcome to ARMA International's webinar, Are Your Organization's Long-Term and Permanent Records and Information Future-Proofed? Today's webinar is sponsored by the great folks at Preservica. I'm Ann Snyder, Content and Education Director at ARMA International. I'll be your host and moderator for this webinar. For those of you who have attained your IGP, the Information Governance Professional Certification, today's webinar counts toward one continuing education credit if you have questions during the webinar, feel free to ask in the Q&A box. Make sure you put it in the Q&A box, not the chat. Those get mixed up sometimes. We're unlikely to get to all your questions today, but we'll respond to any remaining questions received after the webinar has concluded. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items I need to take care of. First up is professional membership. If you haven't checked out your membership benefits lately, we're excited to offer online and virtual opportunities to connect and get resources through your membership. If you aren't an Armour professional member, as you can see, there are a lot of resources to take advantage of, and it's an affordable way to get resourced as an information professional. More information about Armour professional membership and getting resourced as an information professional can be found at our website at arma.org. Infocon 2021, uh, be part of the action and learning uh, and networking with the finest in the profession at our first hybrid conference. We're gonna be live in Houston this year with virtual components online, October 17th through the 20th, 2021. Uh, and uh, with over a hundred sessions and eight session tracks on the agenda, there is something for everyone to learn at ARMA Infocon 2021. Pre-registration for Infocon is open. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> so I'll start with today, we're going to start with some quick introductions uh, to our panelists. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit then about why uh, digital pres preservation is mission critical. We'll then move to why digital preservation can't wait until the information, the, the end of the information life cycle. You often see it uh, to the far right in that life cycle. Um, we'll show you throughout this webinar uh, how this is really something that builds on what you know. We'll be attempting to, to show that the dis demystify the process a bit and show that this is a doable thing and something that needs to be um, on your checklist of, of work that you're doing in your information governance and RIM programs. We'll look at how preservation of digital information is different. So it's building on what you know, but there are some differences that you have to take into consideration. Uh, we'll then turn to demystifying the, the actual process. We'll let you know, we're going to talk a little bit about what actually happens when you put something into a preservation environment, what gets done with it. Um, and a, a lot of that, again, will be very familiar to you. We'll then turn to some case studies, and then we'll look at a demo that shows you how you can, you know, try this out for your, yourselves and see just how easy it, it is actually to get started on digital preservation. We'll open it up then for a Q&A, and next we'll go to some closing thoughts and open it up, um, you know, just for, for any of those last, last questions and any thoughts that, um, that our, our panelists have. We're also going to have a couple uh, polling questions throughout this. Uh, so keep uh, keep an eye out for those and and please participate. So let me first introduce our um, presenters. We're joined today by uh, Lori Ashley, who's from Preservica, and also uh, Dr. Elliot uh, Wilczek. So Lori, can you just say a few words about yourself? Hi, Ann. Great to be with you. Um, I am a marketing manager with Preservica. I've been here for four years. Um, after a very um, fun and successful career as an independent records management consultant. So I know a lot about um, what the Armour practitioners community worry about and think about, and I'm delighted to be with you and to um, see you and to see Elliot again. Also, let's, let's, I just want to make a shout out today. It's, it's Lori's birthday. So if everyone <laughs> can send her a quick uh, birthday wish in the chat. <laughs> well, and thanks for giving me an excuse to dress up. Okay. <laughs> Well, happy birthday, Laura. Uh, Laura. Uh, Thank you, Elliot. So, uh, as I mentioned, my name is uh, Elliot Wolchek. I work at the Meyer Corporation. I've been a records manager and archivist for close to 25 years now. Um, before uh, coming to MITRE, um, I have uh, worked in higher ed. Um, and the other thing I should um, mention is that anything I, everything I say today is my opinions and, and my thoughts and don't represent the uh, positions or opinions of the MITRE Corporation. Okay. All right. Um, let's start with a first polling question. Jen, can you cue that up for us? Oh, there it is. All right. <laughs> Sorry, it's popping on my screen in an odd way. So we'd like you to first ask, answer this, you know, which of the following best describes your organization and sector? 
uh, from one of those choices there where we will share, you'll see these answers come live, but we'll also share the results of this when we send out the follow-up to this webinar. All right. Jen, can we see the, how do we see the results? I'm just seeing the. We still have quite a few voting, so I'm just going to okay. All right. finish and then I'll post. Okay. Hopefully we're gonna see a great spread, Anne, because uh, as we'll talk about, this is an issue that every organization, every size, every sector um, has an interest in. So uh, we'll be fun to see who's on the call today. I'm sorry, you're saying, someone's saying the poll is covering the question? All right, oh, there we go. Um, are people seeing, I don't know if people are seeing the results. So here we go. So can everyone see that? So we are 43% um, government and public sector, 8% education, 5% not, not for profit, commercial corporation, we have 28%, and cultural heritage institution, uh, 2%, uh, and then 14% other. Do you have any thoughts on that, Lori? Um, just glad to see it. Um, I think that there's a lot of good um, happenings in the government and public sector, and, and luckily people can see what happens in that sector. Uh, commercial organizations can't share as easily. And so I'm delighted that um, we have so many people from the public sector, so welcome. All right. So why is digi digital preservation critical? So we were talking about this. I've been sort of itching to do a <laughs> webinar on and, and do more content on long-term digital preservation. Lori and I have actually go back a little bit of a way. Uh, we did a survey on digital preservation, was it 2015? Was that, is that right? So this is something that, you need to be thinking about as a records and information management professional or an IG professional. It's something that, again, we're going to see the in the next slide. We're going to see the, um, you know, the information life cycle. Often, this is th thought of as a thing that happens at the end of the life of information. Uh, you know, somebody's wearing, you know, a gloved person is moving something into a, you know, a, a, a secret room that you don't access, but. That's not the case with our, our current environment. We a lot of our information is born digital, or we're converting it to digital in uh, digital transformation projects. We're doing a lot of scanning, and and you know, uh, we're always asking the question: Can we get rid of the records in the paper form? But we are creating these digital copies of them, and uh, that information is at risk. And you can do all of the other kinds of things that are great from an information governance perspective: have you know security and access controls, and you know everybody has the information in the right hands, the right time. And, and so on, and processes and procedures are being updated, et cetera. But if you don't protect that information and, and think about it from a long-term digital preservation perspective, even if that information needs to be around for a relatively short time, just maybe only you know, 10 years, it can already be at risk of getting corrupted and damaged. And so it's kind of like the, you know, like having a great uh, you know, check-in and check-out and a great inventory system in a library, um, but every once in a while there's a, a fire in the stacks and it destroys some of your most precious collections. So, um, so I have a picture here of this is the Library of Alexandria. Um, you may think this is hyperbolic. I don't. Um, I think this is a, a true representation of what's happening to some of our records right now. I think we've already lost some um, and you know, personal records corporate records and as well as our you know cultural heritage our our record of us as a species um, and this is the library of alexandria it was set on fire twice once accidentally uh, julius caesar was burning ships in the harbor and supposedly um, the library caught fire and some of it was damaged and it was intentionally burned later um, and this is the new library at alexandria so i am my suggestion here is that this is important it's mission critical for you as an individual and preserving your individual records, you as an organization, a corporation, or whatever kind of organization you are, and again, from a, a, a historical perspective, um, it's, it's essential that we take stock of what we're doing and take stock of, of preserving our information that's meaningful to us as, as, a, as a society and as a, as a species. So I'm suggesting that uh, currently the library at Alexandria is burning again and we're not even aware of it. So let me hand it over to Lori and to Elliot to just tell us how they got involved in this and sort of what their take is on, on this issue generally. Thanks, Anne. Um, I, I'll date myself, but since it's my birthday, that's okay. You're all expecting me to be getting older anyway. 
Um, but I think my awareness about um, digital preservation really started when I was working in a regulated gas and electric utility company. Um, utility companies are highly regulated. They have massive um, investments in facility and plant, you know, sophisticated integrated information systems. Um, and the assets that they have have a long life. Um, they also have an enormous economic impact. And, and I saw this in Y2K. I also saw the fact that we didn't really know all the information systems we had running and where all the content was. Um, so I began to think about, you know, what does a, an entity that has long-term operational needs, what are they doing with their electronic information? And that sort of started me on a trajectory that's passed through uh, public sector consulting. And I still have the bug, still have the passion, still think that it's critical for every organization to be well aware of what's, what can be done, what should be done, and just to, to um, move, it, move this into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. What about you, Elliot? Did we lose Elliot? Did we lose him? Looks like we lost him. It looks like we've lost Elliot. He'll be back. So do you think, do you think this is hyperbolic, uh, <laughs> Corey, or do you think this is a fair assessment that we are really losing our, we're in the process right now of, of losing some of our records? There's definitely risk. We definitely have lost some. Um, I mean, these are issues that have been addressed in the archival community and the data mm -hmm. science community for decades and decades. Um, and there are you know, documented examples of where things have gotten lost. I think it's critical because of the primacy of electronic information. We just can't ignore um, the reality of how important our information, I think, Anne, you and I have heard information described a thousand different ways, the lifeblood, the DNA, the, you know, the essential. The oil, the new oil, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And now that, you know, we have this primacy of electronic information. And so we just need to um, get on board and see it as another, as an evolution in electronic records management. It's just protection and preservation. So um, time, time to, time to embrace it, time to get on with it. Right. And, and again, you know, to, to make the point that, you know, th this is a physical library that we're looking at here, the Library of Alexandria. So in the same way that we take care or should be taking care to preserve, you know, preserve those physical records. Um, oh, Elliot's back. Uh, we need to be doing that with our digital ones too. There are some uh, sort of additional considerations. So Elliot, uh, so we're still on on the library, the, this, this topic here. So we wanted to transition to you that you're now that you're reconnected. So it's the sort of why is digital transformation mission critical? <clears throat> right, right, right. So yes, I apologize. I my my connection uh, cut out for for a moment. Uh, you know, I think I just. I mean, to me, you know, my th uh, digital. I mean, digital records is is how how records are are created now. There's not a lot of a whole lot of uh, typewriters in in use anymore, and. Um, I, you know, I mean, for me, I, you know, I'm very interested in institutional and government record keeping. I think, you know, our, our, our society is really profoundly. We lost Elliot again. We lost his sound, yeah. Elliot, we lost you again. Yep, there you uh, are. You can there? you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yep. No, I apologize. Oh, yeah. um, so I think what um, uh, what I was saying was that, you know, that institutional and, um, you know, the records are really sort of foundational to how our societies run and that having um, sustainable, robust, trustworthy records are really sort of a cornerstone to our liberal democracies. All right, I'm going to move to the next uh, the next topic. So this is why um, you know it's related to this sort of why digital preservation can't wait until the end of the information life cycle. So we often see these depicted here. I've I put the on the right is the capabilities uh, that's part of the IGIM, the Information Governance Implementation Model, but it represents the in the center there the uh, information life cycle. So at the right hand side of the information life cycle, far right, you see disposition and archiving as if it's a thing that. Um, can wait until the end of the life cycle, but we've already heard that a lot of our information, and we know this, our, a lot of our information is born digital, um, and there are points along the way that we need to be making the decision to preserve that information and, and put it in a long-term preservation environment or it's at risk. So, Laura, do you want to comment on this? So, we spent a lot of time talking about why this is a, an, you know, again, it's a, it, we understand why it's represented in a linear fashion, but why digital preservation can't wait until the end. Well, I think, you know, it's as simple as the term machine readable. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, all you have to do is think about the, the reliance, the dependence of electronic information on technology and reflect in just our own careers how much technology has changed. Um, so when you combine the, you know, the requirements of records of authenticity and integrity and fixity mm -hmm. with the reality of the churn of technology and the, the fact that we can, we can simply outpace ourselves deploying technology before the record rules catch up, Mm -hmm. um, says that it's not a good idea if you have something that you know is either aging in your electronic systems or mm -hmm. um, has a very long-term retention associated with it, you don't need to and you shouldn't wait until long into its life cycle just because of the, the fragility of digital content, the bits and bytes are, are moving and changing all the time, the dependency is deep and complex. And so I think we can step back and think about what do we know about these assets? What do we know about their use? When can we take preservation action sooner in the life cycle? So I'm mm -hmm. happy to talk a little bit more about that with some specific examples in just a bit. Okay, all right. So just, just to give people a sense of, so again, I think people have an idea that, well, if we, if we save it, if we have you know, backups or we have a, you know, just a, a self-healing system or something like that, that might be sufficient. Um, you know, but there are other things we're, we're gonna get into that, that a digital preservation environment does that, that and, and issues it addresses um, that are a little bit beyond that. But how long, just when do, when do we start getting into trouble with our digital records? Like how long is long-term? Like when did, what, you know, when should we start being concerned? Again, I know there's some obviously that we know are born permanent. So those we might want to be addressing right away, but how long can we wait? Yeah, I mean, some of this, and, and maybe Elliot can come on, on this, some of it goes to sort of your in your IT infrastructure portfolio and culture. Um, so mm -hmm. some organizations or some industries are, their journey into digital transformation is happening more quickly, right? And mm -hmm. so this might be accelerated. But if we look to the global digital preservation community and the standard ISO um, 14721, it is the OIS standard, it says that long term is long enough to, or is to be concerned with impacts of changing technology. So what does that mean, including media and data formats? So it's not unusual for technology to refresh at a three to five year cycle. Mm -hmm. And of course, if we have indefinite records where something has to happen long into the future and we don't know when we can cut off the retention period, then we have this um, indefinite period where we're not sure how long technology will change. Um, in 2007, the Storage Network Industry Association did a 100-year archive study and polled all sorts of practitioners across many different domains and disciplines, and they came out with a consensus, consensus around 10 to 15 years. Same thing. You begin to lose the, the context, the, the control um, over digital assets in that 10 to 15 time framework. So we use a benchmark of if you have an old asset 10 years old or you're creating something today with a 10 year or longer retention period, it's a potential asset for preservation actions. Mm -hmm. I just, you, you commented on, on sort of also losing the context that the churn that we have in the systems is, you know, exacerbated by churn uh, in employees too. So that, that churn has increased considerably as well. So losing uh, an understanding of what it is and the people who might um, have, a, have a, a clear understanding of that within your, um, the, the, right. I mean, people process the brain drain, technology, right. it's all right. Moving at the same mm -hmm. time. So that ecosystem is changing. Ellie, do you have anything that you'd like to add here? Yeah. So I, I think, you know, one thing, I, I agree with everything that Lori said, I think, you know, but one other thing, uh, to think about uh, is that, uh, you know, for me, uh, digital preservation is about making, enabling an object to be understandable across time and space. And so it's not just making, enabling that object to be renderable and understandable 10 years, 50 years, 100 years from now, but also tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Because the records creator is not going to be with the user to explain the record, right? And so mm -hmm. the record and its associated metadata has to stand on its own. It has to be able to be rendered. It has to be able to convey enough uh, information and context so that a user can understand it, right? So if for folks out there that are dealing with, um, for example, um, research data, um, you know, the scientist isn't gonna be there to say, oh, well, this column, the values in here, are uh, you know in the metric system, and they're, you know their centimeters are not inches, 
And so that work, uh, that preservation work of enabling um, records to be understandable out of their original context in which they're generated. I mean, to me, that's something that starts from day one or even before day one that, you know, and this is why those sort of, you know, preservation really needs to be thought of and considered, you know, even before, um, ideally, even before the records are, are created. So, you know, to me, uh, you know, long-term, um, long-term considerations, uh, you know, need, need to, need to start at day one. Mm. Okay. Um, so before we, so we, we had said at the beginning of the, 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 the outset of this webinar that we were going to try to demystify some of this process and uh, show that um, long-term digital preservation is doable. Before we, uh, before we dive into how handling electronically, how electronically stored information is different and how doing uh, long-term digital preservation is different, um, I just want to take a minute, Lori, to just start with, with you know, what our practitioners, RIM and IG pr uh, practitioners already know. And when we were building up for this webinar, you said this is really an extension in many ways of what you know, RIM and IG professionals already understand. That this is really just an evolution. So we see here that we're certainly all familiar with um, uh, long-term preservation of papers, so you, have, you know, an image here of, of you know, file boxes and also film. Um, but can you talk to us a little bit about how this is an evolution and really built on those concepts? Right, so I think, you know, protection and preservation of records, we've been doing it for a long time. And I think if you, if you substitute electronic records preservation for digital preservation, it begins to make more sense. What are the actions we need to take for records that we manage in machine readable format? Um, and it's similar things you have been doing all along. You've um, analyzed what records need to be created and captured. You've captured that in an authoritative instrument or retention schedule. Um, you know, you have policy and strategy expertise. Um, you understand what record management controls are, access controls, what the various roles of people are, redundancy, um, all, all those things which are just a part of the discipline and, and the practitioner's <clears throat> world. We just need to extend that now and embrace um, the capabilities that exist to support us. Mm -hmm. and taking care of the, the longevity of the electronic records management. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is you guys are trusted advisors in the business. You have relationships. You understand the big context. You understand risk management. And so this is just applying that all of those skills and that filter that you bring to the table to electronic records and where they're stored and how they're managed. And to you know, sort of jump in front of the bus and say, are we doing what we need to do in order to protect them? But it's all just leveraging everything you've built in your careers mm -hmm. um, and everything you already know about your enterprise. And you're, and you're likely one of the only people who has that kind of knowledge and understanding at, at, at some organizations. Do you, do you agree with that, Lori? And so yeah. that's a, you know, you're an asset and I think people, you know, you have to make it clear to people that, that you're available for that kind of work and, uh, you know, uh, I do. I don't know about jumping in front of a bus, but certainly getting yourselves yeah. out there and saying, "I'm available to this. I have this, um, this, this knowledge set, and um, and this is why it's important." Right. And I mean, let's let's be honest. People want to get their work done. They're focused on what's in front of them, what their job is, what their role is, what records management and information governance folks bring is that broader understanding. So they know that an application that's used is used in multiple areas. So you can't just look at you know, one part of the business and say, we'll solve the problem there. You've got to look horizontally as well as in those vertical silos. And I think, I think people in this, in this domain and discipline understand the umbrella, but also how the parts feed into, into the whole. Does that make sense to you, Elliot? Yeah, no, I think so. I think you uh, described pretty nicely that it, it's that digital preservation requires a broad stack of skills and knowledge areas and that a lot of it uh, you know around things like context the business value of what you're trying to preserve um, the strategies the um, building uh, you know building and protecting budgets are you know things that carry over uh, from uh, the work that people have been doing in the paper realm so there's a lot of very similar um, 
similar principles and similar sort of management responsibilities that I think really sort of carry through uh, whatever the format um, that you're charged with uh, trying to protect. Mm-hmm. And just one more po- thought I thought of, Anne, in the last couple of days is over the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen the evolution in a lot of records management units reporting into legal or, or IT. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a, that can be very helpful here, right? Because mm-hmm. This because the risks we have with digital fragility are of interest should be of interest to the legal community, mm-hmm. and then the IT people are really folks that need to embrace that this is something different from what they already are doing, or have the capability to do inside the infrastructure. So, um, leveraging to those reporting relationships that I think records managers have worked hard for over the last decade or so. Have you have you um, found certain groups more receptive? So sometimes I in some of the work I've done, I've, I've found some in IT, again, like the struggle is saying this is, there's a difference between saving something long-term versus uh, di- a digital preservation environment. So I know we're going to talk about that a little bit about what's the difference between a, an ECM or uh, a, you know, document management type system and the preservation, the, the saving function and backup and things like that. But do you, do you sometimes, you know, do you find that you run into some resistance on those points? I think someone explained to me once that the that what IT first says always is no, right? Like, no, let's go look to see if we have something in the, here already that can do that. Right. But what I've seen is really, really encouraging in, um, you know, as we've talked to folks, um, prospects and customers in Preservica, the IT folks get it and they're, mm-hmm. they're keen to it. They, they're, they're, they're happy to know that there's some place where aging assets can go that can move off production systems and that mm-hmm. they'll be taken care of and supported. So I'm finding a real uptick in IT understanding and interest. You got to get them sort of over a threshold, but then they sort of um, embrace it because they love technology, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I certainly have seen that, you know, a buy-in from the the, infra, the IT infrastructure side, because if you can, if you can turn off the switch on some kind of an old system that they have, you know, legacy system that they have sitting around just so you can access information there's a there's a uh, real value from their perspective in that because those those legacy systems can be incredibly costly in terms of just time and effort to maintain them and i think every, you know every domain has its own perspectives and and sort of intellectual traditions and also pressure points and i think mm-hmm. you know one of the key things is really engaging in conversations and listening carefully to how people talk about problems and challenges they have. And usually, you know, to me that way, you can tie in um, digital preservation and records management and archives management um, and, you know, weave those into the challenges that, are, that they are facing. And I think, you know, usually if you, um, you know, you can find the angles that where you can really sort of establish good working relationships, whether it's with IT or legal or uh, lines of business. Um, mm-hmm. you know, so I think, you know, mm-hmm. listen, to, listen to the problems that people are trying to solve. Mm-hmm. Good point. All right, let's turn to the next slide here. So do we've, we've just been talking now about sort of building on what you already know. So let's turn for a second to uh, what's different about electronically stored information. Why is What's, what's fundamentally different about this? Why is it riskier? So from my perspective, so I, I come from the e-discovery world and, and I find that, um, you know, records tend to linger in unpleasant ways when you don't want them to, uh, and then often uh, are, are more fragile and more likely to, uh, electronic records are more fragile and likely to uh, deletion or corruption uh, in exactly the, the uh, worst possible time. So that's my lead in. So, so there's, a, there's a sense of, of, in one sense that the electronic records linger, but there, there's a fragility associated with them as well. Can you talk to us ab- about that, Lori? Right. So um, again, machine readable nature of these things that, you know, it's little ones and zeros floating around, um, moving around the world. And just by sitting on media, they sometimes Mm -hmm. disappear and make it difficult to get back to the information. Mm -hmm. Um, We've talked about, you know, custodians change, people change jobs, um, file formats become obsolete. uh, The vendor may discontinue support an operating system goes out of favor um, there's all sorts of things out of the control, right, of the organization, mm-hmm. the records creators, the records managers um, that we have to take into consideration. So really one of the most important things and what's different about electronically stored information is we have to act sooner. We have to take preservation action earlier in the life cycle. So we know if we leave a, a box of paper in 
an office environment, it will, it could be there a hundred years. And if mm -hmm. we, you know, are protected against pests and, you know, the sprinkler system going off, mm -hmm. it's still going to be there. And that's just not the case in the electronic environment. Mm -hmm. Another issue is we can't see what's going on. You can see a piece of paper, you can hold it, you can see mm -hmm. film with your eye. We can't, can't see, see that the, corruption what's going on under the covers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so bad things can be happening or losses or disconnections or broken links can be happening um, when we're not paying attention. And so we just have to, we have to just embrace the notion that we can't wait the way that we can with physical form records. Mm -hmm. um, we still need all the good stuff of environmental controls, but we've got to act sooner, um, at, at least in the 10 year time frame, maybe even sooner than that. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have anything to add on that? Sure. I, you know, to me, I think there's, there's two, uh, you know, I agree with everything uh, Laurie said. And I think there's two other sort of uh, things that come to my mind. One is scale. Mm -hmm. Everything, I mean, really um, electronically stored information is, is about uh, managing uh, a really large volume of materials at scale. So I think, you know, strategically, um, People uh, in this field need to uh, move move away from notions of individually handling record uh, uh, electronic uh, records and, and information, and more towards thinking about writing rules that mm -hmm. machines can act on, and uh, you know, uh, so that you're you're working on. Uh, locating, capturing, ingesting, and uh, running preservation activities on, you know, many, you know, hundreds and, or thousands of, of records at a time. So that, that's one theme. I think the other thing that's, uh, you know, really coming to the fore for this field is, um, you know, for, for a while now, one of our challenges and charges has been to, uh, you know, capture and preserve records so that electronic records so that they're um, readable. But now I think, and particularly you can see this, uh, you know, in, in the, the government space, for example, in the U.S. federal space with the federal data strategy, um, preserved records uh, don't just need to be readable, but they need to be consumable. They need mm -hmm. to be, con be consumable, structured, and prepared so that, th that machines can consume the data that's uh, that's contained in the right in the records that we're charged with with uh, preserving. So I think that's a an extra challenge or a new emergent mm -hmm. challenge that our, our field is facing. But I think it's it's one that um, you know we have to meet because it's the demand um, that at hand that's that's being expected of us. People, uh, you know, the expectation is that records. Um, need to be uh, consumable by by machines and algorithms. Okay. Um, and the, of course, then, just before we move on to the next slide, there are some things that are, and we were talking about what's different about electronically stored information. There are things that a digital preservation environment does that will help you uh, handle some of the issues that you would have had uh, with your paper records, things like, you know, ownership and provenance and uh, cap effectively capturing metadata. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that before we move to the, the next slide? Lori? Oh, did we lose Lori? Uh oh. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll I mean, I, I think that those, I, again, it's a, you know, preservation is really sort of a stack of services that you are um, acting upon the materials that you're charged with preserving. Mm -hmm. And so that ranges from, um, you know, both the, the, the sort of the technical activities of things like checksums to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, sort of establish fixity uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, managing, dealing with formats so that it's renderable. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are also things like, like I was talking about earlier, things like managing the, the metadata so that materials are both um, uh, contextually understandable, right? what mm -hmm. is this record about? And also things, uh, you know, placing that in context so that um, people understand the provenance of these materials so that they have some trust uh, in, in those materials and they mm -hmm. 
that you are supporting authentic records and you're enabling mm -hmm. a reasonable person to judge, ah, this record I'm looking at is, well, I, you know, I'm judging it to, um, that this record is purporting is, it is what it is purporting to be. Mm -hmm. That you can you can count on it. So uh, so we Ellie, we hear all this I, I, you know this this um, buzz about digital transformation, and we've certainly done webinars on that. Um, why isn't uh, digitization of your records good enough? I think you've touched on some of these points. Like why why is that not a good place to stop? Sure. So I think you know first mm -hmm. is that you know digitization is you know every day is going to be a smaller and smaller percentage mm -hmm. of the materials that you're charged with dealing with, right? Um, mm -hmm. A you know growing portion of archives and and records management programs are dealing with born digital records. I think the you know the other thing with um, digitization, as as I talked about before, is um, that it's, uh, you know, people are really looking for um, records to be consumable, not just, uh, not just readable and, and seeable by, by human eyes. So, I, you know, digitization needs to be in if people are engaging in digitization uh, projects. I think it needs to be part of a um, strategic plan about, you know, what is the outcome? What are, what are we trying to deliver to our customers or the communities um, that, that we're serving as opposed to just scan it and, and you know, throw it in an environment and then be, be done with it. But it needs to be part of a, of a strategy uh, that's driven by, you know, what, what is the mission that you're, that you're trying to serve? Hopefully we can get um, Lori back on because some of these case studies are things she's going to speak about uh, directly. So if she's sure. not able to reconnect, we might have to um, reconvene or just uh, tack on, uh, re record this and send it out to people just because those are things she was going to talk through. Um, but we have a, a little bit um, of time before that. So, um, you know, what we see this sort of, again, this, this, uh, this, the current push I see, you know, toward, you know, digital transformation, the, the thing that people seem to be predominantly concerned about is, can I get rid of the paper records? And obviously that's, sure. a, that's a consideration from, you know, storage perspective and so on, which is sort of the, a major push for doing the digitization um, in, in the first place. But, uh, you know, I think that what I'm concerned about is I don't always see those kinds of um, capture or tran digital transformation strategies. Of course, digital transformation isn't just, um, right. you know, scanning, but, um, you know, it's, it's more than that. But I, I don't see as much of a concern expressed over that long-term preservation, uh, right. you know, the, putting it in a long-term preservation environment for things that are, are moving into the digital space. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, there, I mean, there's certainly there can there are plenty of instances where, um, you know, doing a, undertaking a digitization project to um, uh, enable, enable yourself to uh, destroy uh, paper records um, mm -hmm. makes sense. And, you know, particularly in a sort of a tactical um, kind of way, and maybe there's, you know, you have a, a space pressure you're under mm -hmm. or um, uh, things like that. So, you know, certainly that, that, that can make sense. Um, but I think to your, you know, to your point about uh, digital transformation, um, you know, really to me, that's getting at not so much the objects, but it, that's being transformed, but it's the business that's being transformed in digital transformation. Digital transformation is about changing the way people conduct their business, not going from a paper format to mm -hmm. an electronic format. And so if you're, you know, if you are supporting um, a business function that requires a, uh, you know, where trust is an important element, um, where it's, uh, you know, a, a business function that has a long-term aspect to it, such as, um, you know, owning a home or uh, marriage licenses or, um, uh, records that you know d document the the governance of institutions or communities, um, then you know digital preservation is going to have a key strategic yep. component of that uh, digital transformation effort. I am so sorry, completely lost the internet. It's okay. That's, I think you know it's funny. We've been zooming 
for an entire year and and still things are glitchy and i know i somebody said uh they're up in the boston area as well and i know i uh, elliot i think you're up yeah, in the boston area yeah. so uh it's been a little sketchy We're, we have storms down here too so yep. fingers crossed um so we we uh elliot and i were talking about sort of what you know we just continued on this a little bit uh uh so just we were talking a little bit of why digitization is not good enough and again just be clear some there were some comments that we're not we talk about digital transformation and you know we're not just talking about scanning and the things like that uh it's, it's obviously more of a strategy than that, but what I, my, my main comment was the idea that we see a lot of people making that conversion from paper into electronic without, you know, again, the, the main question I hear people asking is, can I get rid of the paper? And I understand why they're asking that question um, from a functional perspective, like, you know, it's why keep multiple copies of it, I understand, but also from a storage perspective, they're saving a lot of money if they can get rid of it, but I don't hear people always asking that question of, hey, well, now I've scanned it in and, or now I've, you know, uh, OCR'd and it's accessible to my systems. What about its long-term um, preservation? I don't often hear those conversations, you know, can't, hey, let's get this into a digital preservation environment. I've only actually had those discussions where I've raised the issue or I've been talking to Lori um, in preparation for things like this. So um, let's move uh, to the next um, poll question, Jen. Um, I think that's what's next here. Well, this woman is very happy. So uh, just, I'm sorry, I, I do, this, this man is in utter despair um, about, you know, his handling his electronically stored information. And then uh, we've moved to this, this woman who's obviously very happy. She's, she's put things in a long-term digital preservation environment. And uh, just a quick quote here from Gartner, just to show that I'm not exactly being hyperbolic and saying Alexandria is burning. Um, you know, it, it seems that organizations might be uh, losing information uh, forever. And so Gartner is uh, raising this question here in that quote at the bottom. So let's move to the poll question. So um, how do you rate uh, permanent electronic records preservation capabilities at your organization. You're currently using a specialized preservation tool and staff, uh, a digital preservation environment, uh, basic capabilities using um, existing IT systems. You're just building the business case, not applicable. You rely on paper and film for records preservation or you're still learning about the topic. Skip and while people are answering that, I'll just add in, um, you know, Gartner and, and Forrester and Infotech um, have followed in the footsteps of lots of um, very smart people and are now recognizing and publishing materials that help the, um, our IT colleagues and CIOs and CTOs um, see this problem, see this issue. So if your organizations, large commercial organizations always seem to um, subscribe to the analysts and so you should look um, among the portfolio of the things that they're writing and publishing, and it can help you uh, make the business case, um, get your colleagues on board. Okay, uh, where are we on this poll? I think, can we wrap it up, Jen, this one? Yeah, we yeah. wanna definitely get to the demystified part. Right, that's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the critical part here. So what are our results? All right, let's take a quick look at these and then okay. uh, keep moving. So. Um, wow, uh, not surprisingly, not a ton of people are um, currently using one, but I'm, I'm surprised at that number is 18%. That's exciting to me. That's, I think, better than the numbers that we saw back in 2015. Is that, I think that's up a bit, the specialized preservation environment. So um, it looks like, a, you know, not a majority, but 46% are using uh, existing IT systems. Uh, somebody did comment that maybe we, you know, they might be, they might be using a combination and want to use, you know, want to answer right. multiple. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so built, just building the business cases at 14%, uh, only 5% are just uh, relying on paper and film for records preservation. Uh, and a good number of people are still learning about the topic. All right, I'm going to close this poll and move on. Um, so we have to mind the gap, right? Definitely a gap. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> And again, um, sorry for that, uh, forcing people into a single answer on that. Um, I understand that there could be a combination of, of approaches that are being taken depending on the buckets of information you're working in. So, um, all right. So this is again, the, the promise of this. We are going to try to demystify what's going on in a preservation environment. So what, what's happening in this kind of environment that's, that's special and then also sort of what's, what's going on so we can just break it down so people know what's, you know, that it's, you know, we, we did talk a little bit about what's different between an ECM and a long-term digital preservation environment, but if you want to tie that in, Lori, um, can you take us through this? Yeah, and I think we have, we have a short demo and some case studies that will bring this to life, so let me um, move through this quickly, is that um, what has to happen is a characterization. So file formats mm -hmm. are complex. There's a lot of bits and pieces that have to be understood, so one of the most important things 
that happens in a digital preservation environment is that there's a match between the thing that's coming into the system against a file format registry, which is maintained um, by the global community, right? So um, even just, it might have a file extension, but that might match, not match what the content is. So mm -hmm. characterization or describing the content and understanding exactly what file format it is, is a very important thing that happens in a preservation environment after ingest. Mm -hmm. There's always virus checks, integrity checks, um, digital fin fingerprints are assigned, um, checksums are generated. Um, oftentimes full text is indexed. Um, all the metadata that can be extracted and captured is captured at ingest. It's a very, very rich metadata environment, which enables that discovery, that search, um, as Elliot was talking about, by people who maybe haven't been born yet, who will need those, you know, assets in a couple um, centuries. Mm -hmm. Always the original is preserved down to the bit level, and then generations are, are made from that in order to facilitate preservation and access. There are hundreds and hundreds of workflows to be um, used to leverage migrations, normalization, preservation actions. And a very important thing is um, at least three copies geographically dispersed um, with self-healing technology so that if something happens, bits are corrupted, um, it can self-heal and there will always be multiple good copies of the original assets. So we, so if we think through this, I, I have some old files from my, my college days and I'm uploading them to the system. They're in an old file format uh, that maybe I don't have the, the software to read anymore. So what happens to it? I, I put my, my uh, you know, 1995 word perfect documents in there and I don't, I don't have that program anymore. How can, I, how can I see it? So you preserve the original and then what happens to that file? Right, so the inside the preservation environment, um, additional generations will be made. And then you can also, mm -hmm. um, the rendering tools are built in. So you don't need the original application. You're able to, to launch the um, file, to play the video, um, to see the, the, the content alive again, regardless of whether or not you've been able to read it um, on your network store. Okay, all right, excellent. Um, so let me just pull up this graphic quickly. We're gonna have to, I, we have one on yeah. leave time for, our um, demo and case studies. So just this is a graphic you were saying, you know, with the idea that you can be bringing in uh, records into this digital, uh, this digital preservation repository, different points in the, the life of the information. So again, the far right, we're thinking about the, the final disposition of it, but um, can you just walk us through this? Yeah, so the classic is that after the light, the record is done and it was appraised for archival value at the end of its life cycle, it will transfer into the custody of an archi archival institution, right? Mm -hmm. But there are long-term, coming from the utility industry, long-term operational records that will be need decades in the, in the future, which nobody's using right now. But when you go to replace that pipeline or to fix that um, facility, you're gonna need to access that stuff. So even though it's long-term inactive, it could have moved into a preservation environment you know, soon after its installation in the ground. And then there's the use case of born permanent. So mm -hmm. in the United States, real property records are born permanent, vital records, death marriage certificates are born permanent. So why can't we move them into a preservation environment, not wait, you know, down the road, right? So this is just to, to say, um, there's sort of two sides I look of it, look at it as of the disposition coin. You need destruction policies as much as you need preservation policies, mm -hmm. right? And when is the right time for that to happen? Depends on the record, the users, the use case, um, and what's going on in your organization. So Lori, we have a question in, in the, the chat. So someone's asking, and I, I think we may have explained it. So we're talking about, the question is, what is a digital preservation repository we touched on a little bit like it's not it's not the same as a just a document management system but there's something fundamentally different is happening in there uh and that's what it, I sort of touched on that with the you know my my you know high school my college documents from the 90s or something like that, that right it's, so it's a purpose-built um technology system and it's purpose-built to preserve which means it will transform it will migrate it will hold the metadata it will add metadata every time anything is touched Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a an environment that's been purpose built to a standard which says if you're going to build one of these things you're building it because you're taking responsibility for the long term and permanent life mm -hmm. and longevity of electronic content. And it's also doing that uh, other function which is sort of uh, the converting the the file. So I yes. I yeah. right. So that's that most ECMs are not doing 
that kind of uh, transformation. No. Um, all right. So as we we're going to go through some case studies, but as we do that, we'd like you to type your answer into the chat. What types of long term and permanent electronic records are you most concerned about at your organization? And um, I'll put this into one of those you know, word clouds uh, and we'll share that as well with the follow-up emails uh, for this webinar. So while you're doing that, um, I'm gonna shift to uh, Lori talking about uh, some case studies. So the first up is um, the LA County. And we'll just go through these really quickly. So this mm -hmm. is the case of um, real property and vital records. LA County was using microfilm, stopped using microfilm a few years ago and now need to take their um, electronic um, vital records and, and real property records and ensure that they're safe, um, accessible um, well into the future for eternity, if you will. So it's a great case study and a very, very large organization um, that's tackling digital preservation. So let's go to the next one, which is a um, corporate ar archive. So HSBC is a global um, investment financial services company. Uh, Tina runs the global archives. Um, and so not only do they have the fantastic historical assets, which come from being a company uh, created in Hong Kong in 1866, but they have all of the important corporate information, um, brand, brand documents, um, intellectual property, um, all sorts of um, business records with longevity in addition to historical archival um, assets. The next one is um, a case study of um, a legacy decommissioning. So a large government agency in the healthcare business um, has records of 45 year retention, um, but needed to decommission the application that they were sitting in. And so they were migrated into the preservation platform and then remain accessible to the, to the staff um, for that 45 year period to run out the retention. And this last one, Brad um, is a city records officer in Milwaukee, very close to where I am here in Wisconsin. Brad is using our new starter edition to um, build a business case. He's testing some things out. He's, this is an example of COVID-19 posters and other um, releases that have gone up in the city. He's also used it for um, meeting videos, for policies and procedures. And his interest is being able to have a public access portal. And so right now he's um, experimenting with our new um, free product starter um, to build the business case for, um, for integrating this technology into the city of Milwaukee's operations. And to, to build on this, we're, we're going to, so, so um, Brad is using this, he's testing out the waters on it and you can try it too. Uh, so uh, Lori's going to walk us through um, just a quick uh, demo of Starter, and uh, let's. Uh, Laura, you said you needed a, a second to to lead into this, right? So one of the reasons, one of the things Ann said it was our objective was to demystify the technology. So this is actually a video I'm going to voice over, and it goes really fast. So I'll do my best. Um, the content in this demonstration system is relates to local government records and archives for a fictitious municipality um, called Washington County. Okay. So as you can see from the repository, you go ahead and kick it off. Um, we, it uses a hierarchical folder structure. This arrangement can match your existing file plans or it can be uh, modified for the unique collections you have in the digital archive. Within the folder, you see typical permanent government records, meeting minutes, ordinances and policies, easements and other property records, their marriage, death and birth certificates, department assets. Um, Seems like it stopped up there. Well, I think that might have been, is that it? Or wait a second, let me try. Should go again. There we go. There we go. Okay. So typical government records. So regardless of the source or original source or format of these records, they're now protected and preserved um, and future-proofed. So earlier we, we touched on risks and challenges of file format obsolescence and other things in our technology environment. So let's look at how a real example plays out. So the original um, application guide that's featured, looks like we've stopped so, up again here. I don't know why it keeps pausing. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Oh, gives, sorry. gives me a little bit more time. <laughs> oh no, hang on a second. That's okay. We wanna focus on a particular document in here and show you what happens um, when it's brought into the environment. So let's see if we can get back Apologies. to Apologies. Let me see, there we go. No worries. There. Well, let me see if I can, uh, I'm not sure why it's doing that. I apologize. This is all working very well before. <laughs> all right good. we're seeing some nice uh, submissions in the chat for um, things that people are storing all right um let's let that 
go ahead. Sorry. Okay, that's all right. Maybe we uh, can people, handle it while we're while we're well. Give people a chance to see it. So these are just you know all sorts of different documents, a file structure that you're familiar with, typical government records. No big surprises there. But there you know some are old, some are you know just new. Um, but what we want to show you is a particular document and what happens to it, which we'll get there in just a second. Um, so what we're going to focus on is this land, this application guide for um, land use permits, right, is a good solid example. So here it comes up. It's in the repository. There we go. So the original of this document is a WordPerfect file. And you can see that on my desktop, I no longer have the WordPerfect file to read it. So if I drag and drop this document into the land use permits folder in starter, the ingest process kicks off. The file format is identified against that registry that I told you about. The files check for viruses, for deduplication, and a checksum or a digital fingerprint um, is generated. So the file and its metadata are sent to storage in the cloud, meaning there are multiple copies in geographically dispersed locations. And should the elements of any of the files change or become corrupt, then those it's self-healing. So those um, will, will um, heal themselves. So here's the document, the WordPerfect document in the system. The system's generated, there's the it, true original and WordPerfect. The system's generated a ODT, which is an XML-based format, as another preservation copy. And it's generated a PDF as an access copy. And that's done automatically by the system. So what you see here in advanced information is the metadata that was generated or captured, the checksum, the file application, how many pages, how many words. Um, but here inside my system, I can now open the WordPerfect document. I can scroll, I can read it without any external rendering tool or the generating application. And so I couldn't open it on my desktop, but once it's in the preservation environment, um, I can read it, it comes alive again. So I mentioned that um, preservation environments are very rich in metadata, which you can see here, and you can um, add it and enrich it over time. Um, so technical, descriptive, structural, and administrative data are captured for every asset using standard schemas or custom schemas. Um, and what you're seeing is it's pointing to the legal citation, which is associated with this document. And then in this particular application in Starter, you can make something public or private with just a click of a button. And by private, I mean, you can see it on the um, external portal. So that's the inside of the um, new Starter edition, the preservation system, which is built on the same platform as all of our editions. So now we're looking at that same document from the public portal. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see full text searching capabilities, um, metadata supports, a you know, searching by staff or by um, external users. Um, and then from this portal, you can, you can browse the whole archive using that metadata, any of the metadata, it will find any asset in any collection that relates to that. And then in Starter, you can also like it, share it, download it, um, make it available there, you know, by increasing the use um, of the assets that you have in your digital repository. So that's digital preservation in three minutes. <laughs> so, I mean, we see, so I, I really like that, that there's this this public accessibility to these documents, which is, I think, incredibly important for transparency in government. If you're working within your environment, though, so people are used to having their information in, you know, X location, um, you know, are they able to connect this digital repository to this digital repository sort of in a seamless way from the applications that they normally work with? Yeah, so in the in the enterprise editions, you know, it gets more complex, um, you know, what you can do in terms of access and permissions and roles. Mm -hmm. With Starter, it's sort of an on-off um, private public. Mm -hmm. But what you're referencing is something very important in the academic environment, which maybe mm -hmm. Elliot can speak to of um, catalog systems or archives have catalog systems, master catalogs. And so you can um, you can add links from a digital preservation system into your master catalog. And when somebody clicks on the link, it will take them to the preservation system to access that um, asset. But it's still, it's so the asset's protected in preservation, but it's available through the catalog um, that's used often in academic institutions and cultural heritage organizations. So this is just quickly, this is who Preservica is. This is all we do. This is what we care about because we know there's so much valuable content in the world um, that needs to be protected. So this is what our technology is all about. And this is our new product. It's free. Um, if you want to you know, jump on a digital preservation platform and have a ride, um, check it out, see how it works. Um, we welcome you to, uh, to give it a try.
All right. Let's, uh, so we are at time, but let's take uh, if uh, Elliot and uh, Lori, if you can hang on for a few minutes, if you want to hang on. Of course, this is the recording. Of this will be available. If we don't get through everything, we'll just we'll we'll follow up um, on the Q and A. So I'm going to try to get through some of these quickly. So, do the panelists have any experience with or opinion on PDF A for long-term preservation of electronic uh, records? I do, Elliot. I'll let you go uh, first. No, Lori, I, I think uh, digital formats are going to defer to you. Um, so saving co saving long term content in a in a um, technology neutral file format um, is a really good has been a really good strategy, but it's not um, the best one. So a PDFs are not all created equal, but PDF A as a preservation format is. Um, is widespread and it's growing. I'm seeing it in, in the government sector saying if you wanna now save government records permanently in electronic format, you must use PDFA. So it's a good um, option, but it's not gonna sustain if it's a permanent record and you need it in a hundred years, I'm not sure PDFA will be the best, um, a best option. I think you really need a, an environment that can move with the times um, and handle just about any file yeah. format. Yeah, it might, it might work for now, but. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So um, somebody asked uh, in 20, uh, 2001, excuse me, Gartner reported, uh, Gartner report noted that it, that anything that needed retention of 10 years or greater should be maintained uh, in digital and analog, uh, meaning microfilm. Is that no longer true? I'm getting pressed that digital files should be converted to microfilm. I'm not sure it's realistic to Elliot's point, given the volume um, of what's going on. There are a lot of things born digital today. You can't store in analog format. You're going to, you know, we were talking about this about email when the government was using a print and file. Like, okay, we lost some invaluable stuff when you did that, but it was a, you know, you, you could do it. So we, I think we've, we've passed the point where that makes any sense um, unless you have oodles of money. I'm not sure it makes any sense. I think we've got to move on and embrace this and figure out what's most valuable to keep, mm -hmm. you know, set those priorities, get strategies, integrate the technologies, embed this capability um, and move on. Um, so I would, I would fight, I would fight that. I would press for, let's make some, let's make some business decisions. Let's, you know, have a sustainable strategy here. So, yeah, how, I, oh, I sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, I concur. Yeah. I, I, you know, and it's, I think we're moving past that point. And I, you know, every, every dollar that you're spending on that sort of duplication is a dollar that you're not spending protecting other records is the other mm -hmm. thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's, let's see if we can move through a couple more. So how does Preservica work with an ECM? I think we touched on that. So there, there's some, you can do stubbing and things like that. Is that correct, Lori? Yeah, I mean, some of that's um, coming, right? I mean, the, the, the traditional use has been content is is moved, transferred out of an mm -hmm. environment into a preservation environment. But what we're working on and what we're seeing more of is the integration so that based on a policy setting in SharePoint or Microsoft 365 or an ECM system, um, the transfer can happen automatically um, mm -hmm. and it will be transparent to the user. So they, they can still access the object in the file that in the, application they're um, comfortable with, but it's already been moved into a preservation environment. And so that relationship goes. So mm -hmm. as Elliot said, from a scalable uh, standpoint, we've got to get to that capability. It's got to be embedded and uh, automated. Automated. So here's here's an interesting one. So the example was a document in an old file format. So the, the drag and drop that you did, uh, Preservica could open it and that's great. But what about data in a database where a municipality wants to move to a new software, Preservica cannot open all operating systems like unique special utility billing programs, I wouldn't think. So I have a thought on this, but I'll hand that over to you, Lori, first, if you want to respond. Well, first I want to make clear, there's lots of commercial and open source tools in this space, right? Mm -hmm. And you can combine them. There are some um, solutions that are more focused towards um, managing data sets in the pharma industry. This is a big issue, right? Um, in government, it's a big issue. In a preservation environment, the content will be preserved and saved. Whether or not you can render it, it may need to be removed from that environment in order to render it in an application. In mm -hmm. the future, if that application is proprietary, um, you know, highly specialized. So moving the data into the environment will preserve it down to the bit level. Um, you just may have to remove it in the future if the thing that plays the data 
um, is so highly specialized. Does, mm -hmm. does I, I'm not sure. Thing? I think the person might also be getting to sort of the the the, the database information itself. So not yeah. just an object attached. So, I mean, this is an issue that comes up in retiring systems anyway. So if you're retired, you're shutting off the system, you have to con typically convert it to a format that you can access. So some kind of an export of the formats uh, of the, the, the files, uh, the, the data in the system. And that's a complex process to especially sort of maintaining the links between the, 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 the parts of the record. So because of that, you know, if you're dealing with a relational database, it's not always that simple to say what the document is, right? So, uh, but that's a, that's if someone, if you, that, that, that question, if you want to grab some time uh, with me afterward, I'm happy to talk to you a little bit more about that process, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of this, but there are ways to convert it into files, right? That can be preserved in the same kind of way. All right. Um, you know, I'm going to cut it here because we're already six minutes over. Um, I want to uh, just thank everyone for being here and people who have not wished uh, Lori a happy birthday. I don't know why. <laughs> I think you've, this is probably the biggest birthday party you've had. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Um, so I'd like to thank Preservica for sponsoring today's webinar, a physical, uh, sorry, um, uh, you know, are your, uh, sorry, I had a typo there, uh, are your uh, organization's long-term and permanent records and information future-proofed? Um, I'd like to personally thank Lori and Elliot for being here today and sharing their knowledge. We are going to have some job aids that are going to be available. Uh, the first one will be coming out along with the email that will come out following this webinar with the, web the slides. Uh, the job aid will come with that. Um, so our next webinar uh, will be announced very soon. So keep an eye on your inbox. Uh, before I close, I'd like to remind you to become a professional member of ARM International. We have an array of resources available to you. We talked about those at the beginning. Uh, on behalf of our speakers and the great folks at Preservical who, who give their time and money to sponsor programs like this webinar today and all of us at ARMA, I wanna thank you for joining us um, and wish you the best in all your information endeavors. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you so much, Lori and Elliot for your time today. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Okay, bye.